project was made possible in part by a grant from the Oregon Humanities a statewide nonprofit organization and an independent affiliated of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which funds Oregon Humanities grant programs. For 50 years, Oregon Humanities has offered programs and publications that help Oregonians connect, reflect, and learn from one another. We are very, very fortunate today to have both a filmmaker and a lead researcher from the Stanford University, I think this is the Stanford University Railroad Workers Project. Is that correct or not? Yes. Um, sort of, we'll, sort we'll of. explain. Okay, all right, so let me introduce them to you. Uh, Barry Fong is a fourth generation Chinese American and San Francisco native. Barry's activities as a filmmaker and community activist is an embodiment of his grandfather's dream of preserving his own experience as a turn of the century Chinese immigrant. Barry continues to live in San Francisco with his wife and two children. He previously served as the president of the board of directors for the Chinese Historical Society of America. He has produced and directed short films about the Asian American experience since 2013. His 2016 film, Digging to Chinatown was well received and his 2018 film, Finding the Virgo has earned several awards. Barry was embedded with the Kandong Village Project for five years. His partner today, Laura W. Eng, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University. Her parents immigrated from Taishan or Hoisan, Hoisan County and she grew up in Los Angeles, California. After studies at UC San Diego with a BA in Anthropology and the University of Massachusetts in Boston with an MA in Historical Archaeology, she worked as a National Park Service Archaeologist Technician at the Manzanar National Historic Site. For the past six years, she has conducted archaeological research on the home villages of Chinese migrants. Um, and I'm just going to say one one thing about the, the village project and then turn it over to, to, the, to the two of them. Uh, most of you who are in the audience know this, but I think it's important to say that between the 1850s and 1940s, more than 2.5 million people left China's Pearl De River Delta region, creating new communities around the world. Uh, this population, actually our population in, in Oregon, stems specifically from this region of China until World War II. Um, their cultural and economic influences uh, also transformed their home villages. The Kandong Project was developed to investigate how daily life changed in migrants' home villages during and after migration. And with that, we'd love to turn this over to you at your program. We look forward to seeing the film. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much, Jackie. What a great introduction. I really love the title of your series, Hidden Histories. That is something that, um, you know, hidden history, erased, his, erased history, ignored history. Those are things that I've always been interested in as a uh, amateur historian and a filmmaker. Um, I wish I was up there in person. I'd love to be able to stop at Pal's books afterwards and, and chop around, but uh, this will do. Uh, so Stanford's uh, Chinese Railroad Workers of North America project started in, in 2012, and their goal was to uh, create a definitive volume and uh, works around the lives and contributions of Chinese railroad workers, uh, specifically to the transcontinental railroad. Um, so this film is really just one small facet of that larger project. And uh, it's centered around a place that is just outside Kaiping, China in Southern China called Chandong Village. And, um, it's particularly interesting to me because my own grandfathers, um, who Jackie mentioned, uh, his ancestral, his village is just about two miles away from Chandung. So this is land I've visited before and land I'm very interested in. And um, so I was embedded with this project. It's a, a, with archeologists and historians for about five years. And to give you some sense of scale, my son was in eighth grade when we started and he was in college when we finished. So it was, it was quite a long time uh, with, uh, with some interspersed work during the year and, and seasonal traveling to China to film. Um, so the goal of the project of the Chandung Village Project was to connect the lives of those in China during the 1890s with those Chinese immigrants who were in the United States through actual material um, objects. And Laura can talk 
more expertly about this. Uh, so through that, through those years, uh, I collected hundreds of hours of video and um, and distilled it down into about an hour, which you're about to see. My goal as a filmmaker has, you know, is in this case as a documentary filmmaker was to, you know, observe and to witness what was happening and hopefully uh, through the film, transport you to this, this small village in China, which is a, at, at maximum 800 people at its peak. And, and when we were there, probably 75 people living in this village. So to transport you there and to compress those years down into about an hour, so you can see the process uh, and the challenges and the successes that the project had. So I'm hoping the film will speak for itself and I'm looking forward to answering your questions um, afterwards and I'll pass it on to Laura. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, I just want to talk about the team and our goals. Um, and so when Jacqueline mentioned the Stanford Railroad, Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project, that's what um, sparked this uh, archaeological research, because actually the goal of that Stanford project was uh, led by Gordon Chang and Shelley Fisher Fishkin, professors at Stanford, that the goal is to look for a document written by a Chinese railroad worker. And they search all over the world, of course, uh, in the US, but also going to China. And in the end, uh, they didn't find any. So what happened was archaeological research. Um, my advisor, Barbara Voss, uh, she is the archaeological director of the Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project. That became more most important for showing how Chinese railroad workers lived, their daily life, what they ate, how what tools they used, how they moved along the railroad uh, track uh, line. And so from that uh, focus uh, and the relationships that the, that Gordon and Shelley were building with colleagues in Asia, we met uh, Celia Tan, Jinhua Tan in China. She's a professor there and she's been looking at the home villages of Chinese migrants in Kaiping specifically or Hoi Peng to, or Hoi, Hoi Peng, Hoi Peng, Hoi Hen, whatever dialect you, you use. Um, so she uh, just said, oh, you should, to, she said to Barbara Voss, you should do an archaeology project in the home village. And so that gave us entry into this collaboration and now we've, also uh, collaborated with the Guangdong province uh, Bureau of Cultural Relics um, because they are in charge of the archeology span in that province. And so this partnership grew out of the railroad project but became its own thing. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Celia Chen focuses on Chinese villages and she actually was already working at Changdong village in, in Hoiping uh, and she's an architectural historian, so she already was trying to restore buildings, but through a, through a, uh, maintaining the layers of history and not just reverting to the 1930s architecture that was part of that uh, remittances sent back from the U.S. or other parts of the world. So um, the archaeology part was something that we were bringing that 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 she didn't have at her university or, or anybody in her team. Uh, so it was a great collaboration in that respect. And in terms of archaeology in China, the Guangdong province, uh, Bureau of Cultural Relics, they don't really do archaeological research on, on villages that are this recent. So even though Changdong village is almost 700 years old, that's that's like yesterday's history for them. <laughs> They're looking more at, you know, really like Ming dynasty is probably when they would be most interested in, in and, and not most interested, but the latest. And um, they're also interested in, you know, tombs of, of dynastic rulers, things like that. Um, although more recently we've learned that they are also looking at folk pottery kilns um, and artisan craft uh, workshops. So that that was great that they they did have this interest. And so I 
also want to say that this was a great collaboration uh, within the archaeology team of uh, archaeobotanists who look at seeds, uh, zooarchaeologists who look at animal bones, and Ryan Kennedy, he's the, the co-director along with me. Um, I look at everything, um, and but looking more like at ceramics, bottles is my thing. And then just people who uh, look at historic archaeology, which in the U.S. is looking at the past uh, 500 years uh, from colonialism to present day, actually. So that's our, um, yeah, that was what brought this collaboration together. And that's what you'll see in the movie. Thank you, Barry and Laura. Before we start the film, I do want to let guests know that we have a Q&A function in the Zoom. So please do feel free to ask your questions and we will monitor them and bring them to our guests when we're finished watching the film. Also, my name is Tracy Kwan. If you have any issues, please do uh, let me know in the chat and I can try to help you out with any technology. All right, I'll hand it over to Sarah and Kapiolani. Anything to add before we start the film? No, let's uh, go ahead and roll it. All right, here we go. Being a fourth generation Californian, growing up in the Oakland uh, area, I've always been interested in Chinese railroad workers. I'd always heard about Chinese railroad workers growing up, but never was able to learn very much about them. And finally, when I came to Stanford for graduate work, I immediately looked for material on Chinese railroad workers, but found nothing. Um, then in 2012, a colleague of mine, Shelley Fisher Fishkin, and I spoke about railroad workers, and she was interested. And she was uh, shocked to hear that there was so little information about them. And so she proposed doing a project together to see if we can locate uh, material on Chinese railroad workers and to bring out more information about them. And we thought about trying to bring on other colleagues who might be able to help us. And one of the things that happened along the way with that project is that, is that Gordon Chang and Shelley Fisher Fish can realize that Barbara Voss was here at Stanford University, who's one of the leaders in Chinese diaspora archaeology. And so they brought her into the fold and then archaeology became part of this bigger Chinese railroad workers in North America project. And so archaeologists have been doing archaeological work on railroad related sites in North America for a very long time. So there's a lot of data to contribute. I've done some of that work looking at uh, food practices and railroad worker campsites. And th there's such a rich body of data, especially when you're dealing with a group of people who don't leave many, if any, written records about themselves. You know, there's not the Chinese, your average Chinese railroad worker. Um, just like your average worker anywhere in the 19th century you know, was not recording everything that happened to them day to day in a diary and leaving it for historians to find. And so archaeology is a great way to look at that. And so that's why archaeology then came into that project. The Chengdung Village Project in China then came out of relationships built by the archaeology network and, and, and particularly the, the Chinese Road Worker Project more broadly. So when I had the uh, chance to work with the um, uh, Chinese Railroad Worker Project at Stanford University. And at that time, I knew Professor Barbara Walsh. 
So when she mentioned that she wants to do something here to compare the findings in Chinatowns in the United States, and I thought it was a very good idea. We started cooperation with the uh, Chinese Railroad Workers Project in 2012. And then um, Barbara came to Changdong in 2014. So for over 50 years, archaeologists in the United States have been studying overseas Chinese villages, Chinese diaspora villages, all the different places in the U.S. West where Chinese workers and families came from this area to work, earn money, and build new homes in the U.S. West during the period of settlement. But here's the thing. No one has ever done parallel excavations of the home villages where these migrants were from. And so we're really only seeing half the story. So our goal for this project is to start the process of filling in the other half of the lives of the people who we have been studying in the United States. Archaeology as a discipline is the study of the material remains of people in the past. And we study those materials to understand the daily lives of the people who lived in times both long ago and very recent. In historical archaeology, we combine that material evidence with evidence from other historical sources, like um, you know, newspapers or oral histories or other kinds of written records that help us fill in the big picture of what was going on. Well, my, my personal hopes and dreams are that we find all kinds of fish bones under the ground. Um, you know, that's my, my number one goal. Uh, but for the project itself, we really just need to know about daily life. Um, what, what, what were people doing? What were they, they eating? Um, what were the kinds of objects they used in their, in their day-to-day practices um, for their jobs? You know, for instance, uh, if they were farmers, um, which many of the people in the village, in Chenggong village were, uh, the kinds of tools they might have been using in the fields that they were working, the kinds of tools they would have been processing the, the, the crops that they were growing with, so different kinds of, of uh, mortar or pestles that we might, we might turn them in the U.S. These are things that are often overlooked in many historical documents. So by putting together the material evidence with the documentary evidence, we get a more complete picture of the past. To our knowledge, this is the first serious attempt to do an archaeological excavation at a home village, a Xiaoxiang, um, of overseas Chinese people who migrated from this area, Wuyi area, in the 19th century to the United States, Australia, Latin America, um, New Zealand, South Asia. Um, to our knowledge, this is the first time that archaeologists have tried to do an excavation of one of these home villages. Before okay. the Opium War, before China was open to the West, I think um, Wuyi culture is very uh, local. It is a typical um, Cantonese culture, uh, like we call Linnan culture. Guangdong was um, very important and was the starting point to open China to the world since the Tang Dynasty. So it has a long history for the people from um, Guangdong to go overseas for, you know, for working. So um, because of this um, background, so the Linnan people or Cantonese people, they are more open and they want to have more like connection with overseas. So much stuff so many people, so much money, so much correspondence moved through those areas, and particularly the, like the business end of the river system. And that, that without that, I, it's hard to imagine the entirety of, of southern China becoming so as developed as it is today with the number of cities, the, the, the huge amount of industry, the, the flow of goods continuing up and down the river. And so it is so central, not just to historical times, but also modern, the modern things that are happening in that region of the world. I was born here, I study here, and I work here. So for so many years, I, I have very much interest in knowing our culture or 
to preserve our history. So I first visited Chengdong Village as part of a group of scholars who were invited to tour the Wuyi area and visit the home villages of Chinese migrants. This was a tour that was organized through the Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project. Dr. Celia Tan at Wuyi University was one of the leaders of this tour, and she took us to Chengdong Village for the first time. Chengdong is um, the first village of the Xie clan. Xie clan had a history of over 700 years in the area. And the Xie clan people started to go to the United States as early as 1839. So it's very early, before gold was discovered in California. So they had a long history of immigration to the United States. And while we were there, Dr. Tan showed us some ceramics that she and her colleagues had found during restoration of, a, um, of the village temple and asked us if we thought that these ceramics indicated that there might be some archaeological potential at the village. And that was really when we, 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 it crystallized in our minds, like this is, this is the project that we want to do. You know, this, these are the areas of the village that we want to dig in. If, if, if we're given permission and all those sorts of things that have to happen in a project like that. One of the most exciting things about this project is its transnational character. It involves researchers from all over the United States and many different universities in China and government agencies in China. But one of the challenges we all had when we started coming together was realizing that research on the 19th century is organized very differently in the United States than it is in China. In the United States, historical archaeology is a very well-developed field and alongside history, and architectural history. It's one of kind of the three pillars of research on the 19th and early 20th century. In China, archaeologists don't usually study this period. They tend to focus on periods that are much older, and late 19th and early 20th century um, topics are usually studied by historians, architectural historians, and folklorists. And so we had a lot of work to do to understand First of all, to understand each other's research culture and then to think thoughtfully about how to bring those two different research cultures together in a way that would complement each other rather than detract from each other. And we're really excited about the outcome of this. Um, one of the interesting things about it has to do with language. In China, our project is known as an anthropological project, something that's related to folk life studies. In the United States, we call it historical archaeology because that's how most people would recognize it here. What was important was that we all figured out a way to come together and do the work that we thought would give us the best results, the best evidence to answer the questions that we hope to learn about. The Center for East Asian Studies and Stanford's Office for International Affairs helped us work with Wuyi University and also the Guangdong Provincial Institute for Archaeology and Cultural Relics to develop an intention of cooperation between Stanford University, the Wuyi University, and then the government agency in China, the Guangdong Provincial Institute, that would affirm our shared intention of building specific projects to integrate North American style historical archaeology and the interdisciplinary approach used at Wuyi University to study home villages of Chinese migrants. Eventually, we reached a document that all three parties agreed with, and that document was formally signed. And that's what opened the door for us to begin to propose a specific research project. And archaeology is one of the um, uh, methods to do research um, for us to know more about the background of the area. So this is among our uh, research uh, scope. That's uh, so when I talked to our director about this um, cooperation, he's, he was very happy. So um, we got the support from our university. During the rest of 2015, my research team and I worked to develop a research design for Changdong Village. And we proposed a very common sequence in North American historical archaeology that begins with background historical research then we do what we call surface studies, where we look at the ground surface um, 
and also identify any artifacts that might be present on the ground surface and use that information to model the predicted locations of below ground deposits. And then building on that, we would actually tr sample the, ac actually excavate to try to locate those deposits and if those deposits are found, excavate a sample of them. Um, we've assembled this team, this multidisciplinary team, to really try to provide a real kind of 360 degree wraparound picture of daily life in the 19th century in this area. The historical documents, the oral history, and then whatever we can learn from the archaeology. And we have different archaeological specialists, people like me who kind of are, uh, you know, team, you know, project developers and managers, um, but people who specialize in material culture, people who specialize in plant remains, people who specialize in zooarchaeology. The best historical research uh, is, draws on different kinds of sources. Mm -hmm. The more, the better. Different kinds of primary sources and then triangulates among them to create a, what you might call a kind of three-dimensional picture. Um, and what's exciting to me is the possibility of combining the archaeological research on um, the villages in this part of China for the Qing Dynasty and early 20th century, combine that with the social historical research on this part of China. The last thing we're waiting for is the official archaeological excavation permit, which needs to be, which needs to be issued by the Guangdong Provincial Institute. And we have been waiting for that, and we are hoping that it will be issued during this trip. At the end of that first trip, you know, we're, we're looking at these sherds, ceramic sherds all over the, the ground, and we're seeing things that we recognize from the United States. We're seeing double happiness, which is a ceramics pattern, a ceramic pattern that's very, very common at archaeological sites, uh, Chinese archaeological sites in the United States, and we're seeing it everywhere. And so we knew immediately this is something that, it, like, there's good stuff here for archaeologists. We arrived here and found out that uh, the excavation permit we had applied for had not been granted and that things were still in process and that there would be several days between when we arrived and when we had resolution about what kind of research we could be doing. And so we really spent a lot of our time gathering supplies. We found, we, it turns out, there's everything within five minute drive of where we're staying, you know, everything that we possibly need. We've got all the tools we need, shovels, trowels, buckets, um, everything else, uh, all sorts of kind of obscure things that we might use as archeologists as well, um, uh, plumb bobs that, dangle down with a weight at the bottom and allow us to take exact measurements of, of different objects um, as we find them, as we excavate them. When we initially came out here, we thought we were gonna dig holes. We thought we were gonna dig six one by one meter holes, uh, about a meter deep, and see what we found. And now we're doing what we call total collection survey, where we're literally walking over the surface of just about the entire usable space of the village that's not concrete. We are doing a surface collection of artifacts in our first area, Area A, in front of the Furin Temple. And we're going in two meter by two meter grids and bagging all of the artifacts that we find that are diagnostic, so ceramics with designs on them or uh, pieces with rims, things larger than five centimeters. And we're really excited about all of the material that we've gotten so far. We are just finishing up Zone A. Yesterday we put a two meter grid over most of the areas where the surface was visible. And today we went through and did a surface collection. So we got all the artifacts that were diagnostic or interesting or old from the two meter areas and they're all being washed. And now we're just taking the flags and stakes back out so they're not a trip hazard. Anything that's on the surface, including landscape modification, land use, and artifacts is gonna tell us um, about the village, how it's used now, how it was used. And um, ideally, in areas where we find a bunch of old artifacts, that'll kind of give us the clue to what used to happen there that we might be of interest in um, to the 19th century era or early 20th century period. Some designs on it. Looks like some horses' legs. So right now we're just flagging the pieces that we find and then another member of our team, Ryan, is going to come back tomorrow and take GPS points for it so we have a position we can map on more accurately. And so what we're finding is we're, we're getting a lot more material culture, finding a lot more objects and, a, and probably a wider range of objects because we're getting them from different places in the village. So instead of doing three, three study areas, we're actually looking at six or seven different areas of the site. So we get not only more objects, we get a wider range of objects. And I think at this stage in our project, that's important. It gives us a better idea of the kinds of materials that are here, 
uh, maybe what, what we should expect when we dig. After the collection comes into the lab, we start, first we wash everything, and then we wait for it to dry, and then we start sorting it into different material types. Um, so that's what we're doing here, is looking at whether it is a whiteware, an Asian porcelain, Chinese brown glaze stoneware, uh, glass, metal, those are some of our basic material types. Um, and then we're looking even closer at some of the use possibilities. So things like tableware or whether it was used as a cooking implement or storage. And so those are our three uh, primary categories for cataloging all of these artifacts. And that will really uh, streamline the processing later on when they do a more in-depth analysis, as well as other types of things like glass, if it has any maker's marks, if it's a, a metal object, if it was structural in nature. So we do all that kind of sorting first right after we wash the materials, we separate them out, and then we move on to a more in-depth analysis. Yeah, so one really notable thing that we found is this Chinese style toothbrush, which we do see in California. And it has a very distinct pattern that's very different from British made toothbrushes where you can tell from the whole patterns how it was manufactured and where it came from. What I can tell about this bottle, it looks um, machine made because of the mold seams here and there's embossing, there's words on the base. And this embossing is in Chinese actually, which is really cool. That's where the embossing on the bottom of the bottle is actually who made the bottle, the company that made the bottle, and not the actual product that was in it. And um, that might not seem useful to some people, but it actually is because some companies were only manufacturing things for so long. So we can use that to date this bottle. We didn't see any Four Season Flowers um, porcelain here, and we see that um, in the U.S. a lot. Um, there's a very high amount of Four Season Flowers, and here there's like absolutely nothing, and a very, very low amount of um, bamboo, and that was also kind of surprising, but there's also just this huge amount of double happiness, and I was wondering why that is, and hopefully we'll find answers to that in the future. There was very little Four Season Flowers. There was more double happiness found in China than, than on sites here in America. This is um, Four Seasons Flowers, uh, and it generally shows flowers in the Four Seasons. Double happiness, which is very common, winter green, and bamboo. I'm really interested in is there's more of an abundance of peck marked ceramics here. Uh, in the United States, we see a very rare amount of peck marks, which are little marks showing up in the bottom of bowls, usually someone's name uh, or a family name. And they're just very, very abundant here. And that's something that was really interesting for me to see is just the amount. What we saw and what we found there was that not only did we have all the kinds of Chinese made ceramics that you can imagine, the things we've never seen in the US at sites, stuff that's unique, at least that we, we don't think was being exported. We also had British whiteware ceramics and we had things that were coming that were uh, medicine bottles and things that were, that were very clearly not Chinese produced, but that instead were, were from Europe or from the, the Americas. And, and that's, that was really eye-opening, right? And we realized at that point that it's definitely worth trying to come back and dig here to see what else we find. One of the things that we are really trying to do here is obtain a sample of material culture that we can compare to the material culture we excavate from Chinatowns, railroad worker camps, other Chinese diaspora sites in the United States and elsewhere. One of the things that was very exciting was seeing the similarities and also the differences. And there were some surprising directions in both of those. Um, one of the really exciting similarities is that in, uh, in Chinese diaspora sites in the United States, 19th century Chinese diaspora sites, we see a mix of both British produced and Chinese produced ceramics. One of our big research questions was, is that because Chinese immigrants in the United States are buying British ceramics for the first time in the United States, it's kind of a, would it be a new thing? Or is this something that is already being used in the Wuyi area 
and it's a very familiar material culture. You know, this project is truly transnational, as well as a study of transnationalism, as in we're in China, we're looking at one site, but we're connecting it to Chinatowns, Chinese settlements in the U.S., and we're we do research in both the China, on the China side and the U.S. side. I'm really excited to kind of go back and relook at my site um, through the lens of what I've learned here in just you know three weeks, four weeks. What can surface data tell us in a different way than excavation data can tell us? And so I've been thinking a lot about that, and I've also been thinking a lot about how to build towards the next step. So we returned in 2016, in December of 2016, and we conducted all of our surface studies at that time, did our analysis of the results of the surface studies, produced a report, and went back in August of 2017 for a workshop and conference, not only with Wu Yi and the Guangdong Provincial Institute, but also representatives of archaeological museums in the area who had expertise in this subject. We presented our results. They presented information about the research they were doing. We spent a lot of time brainstorming together and eventually came up with a research plan for subsurface testing that was circulated and approved. And then we returned in December 2017 to actually implement the subsurface testing, which was successful beyond our wildest dreams. You know, excavation is my favorite part of being an archaeologist. There is nothing quite as exciting as peeling back the layers of earth and seeing what's concealed beneath and being able to physically encounter the things that people used and held, whether it's 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, that tangible connection with the past is one of the things that continues to inspire me to do this work. And we used a lot of different lines of evidence to pinpoint the locations we thought were most promising for the discovery of subsurface deposits. So the first thing we did was we systematically reviewed all the data we had collected during our surface collection. We calculated densities of artifacts throughout Changdong Village um, by both weight and by count. We also looked at where had we found some of the most diagnostic historic artifacts locations where we found ceramics or bottles that clearly dated to the late Qing Dynasty or perhaps even earlier. We plotted all of that information on maps, showing the various densities of artifacts as well as the hot spots where particularly important artifacts have been found. From that, we identified about 12 hot spots throughout Chengdong Village that we felt the, survey, the surface survey collection evidence most strongly indicated would likely have buried subsurface deposits beneath them. Once we identified those hotspots based on the survey data, then we looked at what we call landform conditions. Um, were there patterns of erosion or patterns of soil deposition that might have affected the placement of surface artifacts? We also reviewed our oral history research with village residents and um, talked with them about land use patterns, the histories that they remembered about earlier land use, to see if any of our hot spots correlated with places that village re residents remembered as places where people might have deposited their trash or done other activities. In the end, we winnowed it down to four locations. And in each of those locations, we excavated a one meter by two meter testing unit to probe down beneath the surface and see what we might be able to find. What we did was actually very standard archaeological techniques, which is we, we actually dig along a grid. And so this is a square system grid, so we can actually know where something is coming, both horizontally, like on a north and an east angle, and then also depth as we dig, we, we take measurements. And, and we, we dug um, a, a, what we would consider a small number of holes in the ground. The excavation process uh, for us in historical archaeology is actually quite simple. And what we do is we, we, we determine where we want to dig. Once you pick your spot, we're really tidy. We want everything to be in order. We want it to be lined up. So we literally, we take a string, we draw, we, we, we run the string around the edge of, of the square hole that we've measured. Usually it's one by one meter or two by two meters, some like easy to remember number. And then we dig. And we just dig in la layers. 
you know, as, as the soil color changes, it usually means something different. Like if you have done gardening or work in the yard, you know, your, your topsoil is dark colored and what's below it is often not. We're looking for those kinds of changes. And every time we see a change, we know we're in some sort of new type of soil. On our second context, context 202, which is basically the second strat. And we're coming, actually I'm pretty sure getting near the end of this context. Um, as you can see with the lighter modeling over there. But this one was very much like kind of architectural stuff with a lot of like mortar and brick flex. And we, we collect all of one type of soil together. We get the artifacts out by putting the soil through a screen. Put the screen, put the artifacts in the screen, you kind of shake it around. Artifacts stay in the screen, soil falls out. So this is shaping up to have really nice stratigraphy. This is kind of what we hope for in a perfect world. What we have right here is the really distinct garden layer where they were actively growing ginger and some other plants up until we put in this hole. This here is a rubble layer that has a lot of modern garbage in it. We think the last 10 years or so. Um, and then we've hit another distinct layer without the garbage, without the brick rubble underneath. You do that and collect each artifact grouping for each level. So like the upper level has its own bag, the next level has its own bag, and that's how we keep things separate. But that's, that's the process. And rinse and repeat every new hole you dig. I am sorting different kinds of bricks to see what kind of bricks were used in the original construction of the temple. So this morning we found something exciting. Uh, here is a carved ceramic, which might belong to the window of the old temple. Uh, so the old temple was built around the Ming Dynasty. So it's very possible this is a Ming Dynasty um, temple window. And in addition to that, we found two um, big um, stone structures, which had sort of a rounded carved surface, which may also belong to the, to the old temple thought now is that we're, we're excavating the demolition of this temple that's been reconstructed. The temple was originally constructed during the Ming Dynasty, but it was taken down um, in the 70s. I think for that, it really made such a pivotal historical moment very real, and sort of seeing the kinds of things that were going on in this region, since it's not very much talked about in Western history. Uh, once we excavate everything, you know, it's, it's all labeled by where it came from, what hole it came out of, what excavation unit it came out of. And so at that point, it goes into our lab. And we, wa we rinse it and wash it. And sometimes you don't want to if you find a really cool medicine bottle that looks like it has medicine inside of it, which does happen. You don't want to rinse it all out because then you've lost the evidence of that medicine. But otherwise, you just rinse the, the artifacts off, gently clean them, make them so that you can actually see what sort of pattern is on the ceramic, or is there a label on the, the, the bottle that you're looking at. The depth of something and its age is not always related. This looks like a situation where, for whatever reason, a pit was excavated into this area, probably for use during construction activity. It looks like there's some mortar and lime residue on it. it might have been used as a lime mixing pit or, pit or a mortar mixing pit. And then when they were done with it, it was a convenient place to throw some trash. So it could have been 50 years ago, could have been 150. What we originally thought this unit was going to Rel and relatively soon turned out to be actually pretty complicated and there's a lot more materials coming out than what we thought there would be like there's that entire line of like mortar or lime um so i mean we knew there was a house here now the question is whether or not this deposit is dated to that house as well and we're getting down into what looks like intact older deposits so that's very exciting and one of the things we pulled out today um, are these three coins and once they get cleaned up a little bit it's very likely we can get um, a date off of them a lot of times the coins can be really old but they can be forgeries or there's a lot of information you can get from coins and um, what's the inscription so this will be a fun way to kind of see how our layers are changing as we go down so what we're doing is a water flotation process and this is a way to systematically collect, in a controlled way, plant remains from an archaeological site. And we're collecting these remains because we want to find evidence of plant use and the environment at the site and track how it changes across the site and through time. And we're looking at how people interact with the plant world, how they use the plant world, 
how their use of plants is restricted by the environment, and then also how they change the environment that they live in. It's based on a very simple process because plant remains are lighter than water and they're supposed to float, whereas the dirt and the ceramics and other things that are in the sample are smaller than water, and they should sink. And there are lots of ways of doing flotation that are kind of mechanical and go very quickly, but since we only have nine days of excavation here, we're doing it at the very simplest level, which is what we call bucket flotation. The equipment we're starting with is a bucket of water, a chiffon netting to collect the material that floats to the surface, and then on this side, we have a plastic screen that's uh, a little bit, has, has wider holes to let the dirt fall through but still collect all the ceramics and bones or whatever else came through the sample. So this we call the heavy fraction because it sank and we call the other the light fraction because it floated. And then it goes through, depending on the kind of object it is, uh, for ceramics analysis, we were asking what pattern is it, what kind of, of vessel is it? You know, I think at home you have a plate, you have bowls, you have teacups, you have those sorts of things. We're looking for the same kinds of things in an archaeological site. So what kind of vessel did it come from? And then you do the same for different kinds of materials. And at the end of the day, then you have all this data from each kind of artifact. So the metal has a different kind of, of data that we're collecting, the bone, the ceramics, the glass, and so on. What is Unique and exciting about this project is not just that it's the first study of a Chiaoxiang, but that it's come about through this long-term partnership that has been developed between US-based US scholars, China-based scholars, but also scholars across different disciplines, right? Architectural historians, historians, archaeologists, oral historians, filmmakers, um, folklorists. I think this is really the future of research, that we both realize that when we're studying the modern world, because people are very mobile, we cannot study it from just one national perspective. And I think the other part of it is that because each discipline has its strengths, but it also has its limitations, interdisciplinary work is really the only way to get the full picture of people's lives. We, when, you know, when you start an excavation like this, you don't really know what you're going to find. And what we found is that we're getting an incredibly large amount of, of um, ceramic tile and brick and things like that. And the, because, because this is still a standing community, the better source of information about architectural materials is actually on the buildings itself. There isn't a lot of research benefit to collecting large amounts of broken tile when we could actually take samples from extant buildings. And so what we've decided to do is actually um, keep a representative sample so that if in the future there are archaeologists who do want to do, say, chemical analyses or something like that, there's some material available. Um, but most of the tile we're actually just going to backfill back into the unit. I don't know anything about Chinese ceramics, so it's been really cool to see the different types. Um, and especially when you, when you wash something and something comes out that you're not expecting, and that's really beautiful. The data set that we've gotten is so critical it's the only data set that's out there to be able to compare all of this data that we have from North American Chinese sites, people that were working at railroad camps, people that were living in urban Chinatown communities, people that were at mining camps. So much data from North America uh, and Canada as well, not just the United States. And now we have something to compare that to. The gaming pieces, I think for me, was one of the most evident examples of this because I have a collection from the Chinatown near Vancouver and there's a whole set of gaming pieces and I found half of one here and they're exactly the same. It has such a different context, you know, it's in China where this stuff came from and that's been really exciting to kind of stop and think about the comparison value of this data set which we've really been missing um, in overseas Chinese studies. I think the biggest surprise for me is how quickly the local villagers forgot about their history. Um, I remember like um, we, were, we, we were digging a pit that contained a lot of uh, temple debris. Mm -hmm. And when we conducted some of um, the oral history, um, we, th it appeared that they don't, they don't have a coherent story about you know how the temple was destroyed and how they recreate the the things afterwards. And that's not uncommon when we're doing uh, archaeological work. We'll ask people that live in the area what 
what kind of uh, history they know about a particular place. They'll tell us their memories of it, but there may be other things that happen there that they don't know about or that they've forgotten. And so we oftentimes find that that's what's under the ground is a little bit different than what people remember. It's a very, very good um, uh, memory of the archaeology team working in the in Changdong village. We learn a lot from them because we don't know, you know, anything about archaeology. But from them, we have we know, you know, how to do it. We know the knowledge, and we know the values. The deposits that we found from the late Qing Dynasty roughly 1865 until 1912, correspond exactly to the period that here in the U.S. West we have sites related to Chinese immigrants on the railroad, in mining, in logging, the formation of Chinatowns in major urban cities. And so we can do a direct one-to-one -one comparison of these deposits from the same time period. Well, I've mentioned that we had a problem locating any textual evidence uh, about the railroad workers, anything that they left behind. In China, we've uh, identified some families who have memorabilia, maybe implements or some tools from the railroad. They say that their ancestors brought with them back from the United States, uh, but still no document from them. So we th understood that we had to develop other sources of information to tell the story, to see if we can reconstruct the story. And that's why we turned to archaeology very early on and Barb Voss's wonderful work to understand the material culture left behind at the labor camps and other places of the Chinese railroad workers. So when we started our research at Chengdong Village, what we really hoped to find were archaeological deposits that dated to the period before migration, the period during mass migration, and the period after migration. So that would have been prior to 1860, about 1860 to 1910, and then the period after that. What we found in our research actually was that for various reasons, we weren't able to locate deposits prior to migration. So the deposits that we found really date to what we think of as the late Qing Dynasty around 1865 to 1912, and the early Republic period in China, 1912 until World War II. So those periods give us the during and the after period three out of the four subsurface test units that we excavated hit intact deposits from the time periods we were interested in, and that was an incredible result. So in archaeology, we often look for patterns, but sometimes we find a single artifact that tells the whole story in itself. And in this project, the artifact that had the biggest impact on me is this very small, little, colorless glass vial, a medicine vial, that was made by the Abutin Medical Company in Oroville, California, over 6,000 miles away from Changdong Village, English and in Chinese. And although the Abutin Medical Company is fairly well known to archaeologists and collectors in the United States, there had never been any, ex any examples known that I've been able to find of a bilingual bottle being produced and marketed by this company. Once we identified the bottle and verified that it indeed was from the Abutin Medical Company in Oroville, that opened up a whole new range of questions for us to investigate. Little by little, we started to put together the pieces of what might have happened. The Abutin Medical Company was founded by R.M. Green in 1885. And R.M. Green was not a doctor. He didn't have any medical training. He was an entrepreneur. So why did R.M. Green start a medicine company? Um, and how did he get the expertise needed to develop medicines from this local tree sap that was becoming popular as a medical ingredient? The real clue came when Scott Baxter, one of our archaeology colleagues who's been involved in the Chinese Railroad Workers Project, visited the Oroville Temple and saw a photograph taken on Chinese New Year's in Oroville that shows both R.M. Green and a Chinese herbalist, Chung Kong Yo, in front of Chung Kong Yo's store. Clearly, these two men knew each other. And in this photograph, they're standing very close to each other, along with other prominent members of the Chinese and Euro-American community in Oroville. So we did a little more research then on Chung Kong Yo. We learned that he was born in the 1840s in Taishan, um, Taishan County, that he emigrated to the United States in 1866 to become a laborer on the first transcontinental railroad. 
And after the railroad was completed in 1869, he settled in Truckee, California, where he established an herbalist store. And it's clear that he had prior medicinal knowledge um, from his, before he emigrated to the United States to work on the railroad. So for whatever reason, likely because of the strong anti-Chinese movement in Truckee, he moved to Oroville in the late 1870s and established his new store in Oroville where he primarily sold Chinese medicines and um, also provided import-export services, helped um, Chinese workers in the area send remittances back to their home villages in the Pearl River Delta. So by this point in the 1870s and early 1880s, he was a really well-established businessman, someone who both was using his expertise in Chinese medicine, um, but also had well-developed connections with import-export companies and the financial world of international business. We don't have anything that concretely proves that R.M. Green and Chung Kung Yo collaborated in developing the medicines that were sold by the Abiotin Medical Company. But we can infer that R.M. Green had to have some kind of partnership, one, with someone who was knowledgeable about the medicine world, and two, with someone who knew something about import, export, and marketing to the Chinese American and overseas Chinese communities. And the association between R.M. Green and Chung Kung Yo in this photograph provides one possible link between a former Chinese railroad worker, someone who emigrated from Taishan, used railroad work as a way to amass some capital to build a business, um, and R.M. Green himself, an entrepreneur with no medical background and no import-export background, but who clearly saw an opportunity for a growing market. Uh, Kai Ping is very famous for defensive dialogue. And the reason why people built Dalo to uh, for defense, it was because the overseas Chinese people brought back money, so um, they need protection. So that's why they built the Dalo. And to go with the Dalo, guns are very, very um, important for the local area. We found several gun flints. So these are um, small pieces of stone that have been shaped so that when a steel hammer hits them, they set off a spark that ignites the gunpowder that propels the bullet or cartridge out of the gun. What's particularly interesting about these gun flints is that they are all of British or French manufacture. They all date to the um, late 18th and 19th centuries. And they're found in deposits from the Qing Dynasty. And so even though some of them may have been manufactured earlier, it's clear that they were in use during the late 19th century and early 20th century. We were surprised to find these, both because this is a quiet domestic village today. The first thing that became obvious when we found the flints was, of course, we were likely going to find gun parts and gun materials because this area, part of the reason why people migrated from this area was because the 19th century was very turbulent and full of, full of violence. And every clan would have a watchtower, at least. And sometimes they would have their own communal tower in the village. And in the communal tower, they would have guns. So they imported guns from Canada, the US, or Hong Kong, Macau. So, so they brought back these guns and used it when bandits came. It shouldn't have been a surprise to us to find these objects, but yet because today Chengdang Village is so quiet and so peaceful and such a calm place, it still caught us unawares. And what was really fascinating to me about this project in Chengdang Village is that we didn't find many animal bones. There may be a dozen total animal bones in our entire excavations. Number one, because we eat bones. You know, Chinese people eat bones. And we use bones to cook for soup for a long, long time. So this is one thing to make, bone, to make bones disappear. And number two, when we cook the, the bones in soup for a long time, and after eating by people, the dogs, you know, dogs would eat all the bones. 
but we found, what we found were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of freshwater clams and freshwater snails. Like so many of them that did, and they were not in the pond where they occur naturally. They were, they were much further away from the pond, and so it was very clear that they had been removed from the pond and probably eaten at some point. And so I think the story for me, the take home is, it's all about that local uh, mollusks that they had in the pond. They could collect them, they were a good food source. You can still find those exact same species in the grocery stores today in Guangdong. So I think a lot of this actually, I, I don't think it's about a true total absence of meat. I think there's a couple of things going on. I think one of those things is that a lot of the meat that they were eating was probably preserved in some way. So things like sausages or bacon, these sort of shelf stable foods that allow you to use a little bit of it and it goes a long way as a seasoning or as an ingredient in a dish. I think they're also using the bone as a kind of resource in and of itself. And so we've seen people using bone to put into the fish ponds as food for fish or put into garden beds as fertilizer. Everywhere we put a subsurface testing unit, we found evidence of pits that had been excavated during the late Qing Dynasty in order to harvest soils for construction, right, for making clay brick, for other kinds of construction materials, or pits that had been dug for construction activities like mixing lime mortar for mortaring bricks together. Those pits, once, they're, once the pits were abandoned, those pits became places where people threw their household garbage. And so we have this incredibly rich, dense deposit of household materials, um, you know, broken ceramics, um, discarded glass bottles and metal containers, um, buttons and hooks and fasteners from clothing that was likely used up and was discarded, all kinds of little things that together give us a really rich picture of what daily household life was like in this village during the late Qing Dynasty and the early Republic period. We found thousands of artifacts. And so what's exciting about this for me is it shows two different things. The first thing is it shows that residents in Chengdong village during the late Qing dynasty were import, and we have other artifacts that speak to this as well. British whitewares, um, other kinds of medicine bottles, clothing. Residents in Chengdong village were were using so-called Western products, goods that were manufactured in Europe and the United States, and that was part of their daily life in this small village in the Pearl River Delta. And so it's very clear after this work that, that rural villages in southern China were not isolated farming villages with no connection to the outside. People were coming back and forth, money was coming back and forth, letters were coming back and forth, and as an archaeologist, the things that I see are material goods were coming back and forth. And this, these, are not, these are not farmers who were living out in the middle of nowhere with no connection to urban markets. They had connections. They were buying these things or they were bringing them back with them to the village or, or their relatives overseas were sending them things from other places. And so they were familiar with this stuff. They were probably eating meals in Chengdong village off of these really large transfer print platters that you might see in a, in a kind of Victorian era home in the United States or, or in Europe. And so they were not isolated people by any means. And, and so that's actually, you know, when you think about someone leaving somewhere like Chengdong Village and going to the United States and, and maybe working on the railroad, as archaeologists we've often thought when they first got to the United States and they start seeing all those European and American made ceramics and all these sorts of things that they're going to be shocked because they've never seen them before. Like newsflash, no, they have. They're probably eating off of them. The Chinese and Euro-American business people were collaborating with each other to develop products to sell back to China. And so the Abutin medicine, medicine Company bottle, in the end, it's neither a Chinese artifact nor is it an American artifact. It's a transnational artifact that emerged from these flows of ideas and materials back and forth across the Pacific between the Pearl River de Delta and the United States West. I am overwhelmed by how generous and welcoming the village residents are. We are doing things that normal people don't do. Walking around and picking up trash off the ground and then cleaning it and putting it into bags and writing about it. It's, this is not you know, normal routine here in the village. Um, everyone here from the village head, Mr. She, to uh, all the people who work in the kitchen, the drivers who have been hired to bring us from our hotel to the village and every place else we need to go. Um, the staff of the Changdong Heritage Education Project have been so friendly, so welcoming, so accommodating. Um, 
and made us feel so welcome here. And I, I know that we are probably being a lot of trouble for them. And I'm very, very honored and very moved that they're being so welcoming. Um, so on the people side, I just want to say, you know, I just feel incredible gratitude. The image of the Chinese railroad worker, if one had one at all, before the project and before the release of this information, is of someone who was poor, destitute, illiterate, uh, forced to do work that uh, no one would want to do, and was exploited uh, in a terrible way. Now, that is not altogether wrong, but it's incomplete. A lot of the workers were literate. A lot of the workers were very entrepreneurial. A lot of the workers were very savvy in how to sell their labor and to parlay their position for other uh, opportunities for work and business, certainly after the railroad. They were capable in handling money. They were not all just uh, uh, unskilled workers. Many of them had masonry experience. They learned how to tunnel. They knew how to use explosives, drive uh, teams of, of uh, horses. So they were quite a differentiated lot. They were cooks. They were businessmen. Many of the labor contractors, I like to think of them as beginning the business community. They were, we know that some of their, we have some of their writing, just a little bits and pieces here, so we know that they were literate. And we also have, we observe testimony of journalists and others who see, who saw a lot of the workers on their spare time reading. You know, they're just reading novels and they're in their tents reading. So, and they sent uh, thousands, tens of thousands of letters and, and remittances back home. So um, the story is much more interesting, I think, and varied, and I think reshapes the narrative of the 19th century Chinese to one in where you had a large number of laborers, unskilled or, or, or who, who worked mainly just as laborers, but others in a whole variety of different capacities who worked on the railroad, after the railroad, and then spread throughout the United States. Thank you all for uh, spending the morning with us watching. Um, there are a couple great questions out there. And uh, I'd start with Keith Lee's question uh, asking about where this village is located. And if you look in the Q&A, there are a couple of maps that I posted uh, pointing at the village. So it's about, uh, I believe about 10 miles um, southwest of Kaiping city. And as Laura, Laura mentioned, it takes about 20 or 30 minutes to drive there from Kaiping. Um, and if you have never been to that country, that part of that of China, um, it's actually kind of almost tropical. It's very humid and warm and jungly. Uh, without the, the the human interference, it would be very 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 lush and um, thick with with uh, plant life. Um, that's one thing that's very hard to transmit through film. And um, and the second thing that um, Tracy asked was. Uh, if there's a story or part of the story that I had to leave out. And the length of the film is cut uh, specifically to be able to fit into a um, classroom situation. And so if I had another 10 minutes, I'd probably talk about the architecture, which is what Celia Tan is, Dr. Tan is uh, focused on. The um, architecture, if you can stand in front of the village, you look at some of those shots across the front of the village, tells you so much about the 
you know, 100, past 150 years in China from the um, single story gray brick uh, traditional um, building and layout to the uh, what they call mansions, which were built with overseas money sent back to China. These are multi-story, multi-bedroom uh, homes built with newer construction techniques. And then finally, this kind of wave of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, uh, modern uh, condo uh, for them, kind of a McMansion style stucco building. So the whole story is right there in front of you, 150 years laid out and the influence of the West is really apparent, especially in the mansions. The mansions have um, Western architectural details that are not perfectly accurate to, to, to Western uh, architecture or European ar architecture, but they are influenced by uh, those uh, outside uh, places with columns and decorations. Um, so if you have a chance to go back and look at the film, maybe take a closer look at those uh, panning shots of the front of the village and you can get an idea about what I'm talking about. And there's a question for Laura too. Yeah, I see uh, Tracy's question about what was my favorite artifact that I found and that there probably was a lot of emotions being in this area that um, my parents are from. They are immigrants. Uh, they came to, the, to California in the 1980s, but my great, great grandfather came to the US. Um, I don't know when, but he actually died in the US and he's buried somewhere in Utah. But I think the, the fact that um, most of the Chinese immigrants before 1965 came from this part of the world, Kaiping, Taishan, um, uh, two other counties is, is amazing. It's a very small area. So in terms of the artifacts, I, I think my favorite probably has to be the double happiness uh, ceramic rice bowls that uh, was mentioned earlier in the documentary. And how there's so much of it. And I love the peck marks that pretty much every rice bowl has. Uh, and this is a, probably a symbol of household ownership. And because everyone in the village has the same name, surname, uh, Shia or Dia in the local dialect. The, the symbol on the ceramic bowls are not, they're not Shia, it's, it's not the Chinese character for their last name. So a lot of it is symbolic, like wishes that they want for their family, or it's something, even a, just kind of random too, um, like the character for Sir. <laughs> so, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, I found in my research, I, I'm actually looking at another village in in Taishan for my dissertation, and it's a village that was actually built in the early 20th century by Chinese migrants, uh, who a lot of them lived in Los Angeles or Riverside in San Bernardino, in Southern California, and the people who I, I found I found peck marks too on the ceramics I've collected. And some of them are symbolic, uh, they're coins that they've pecked on there. And others are like um, like a leaf or something like that. So it's super interesting to see that individualized aspect in archeology, span in, in an artifact, when on the outside, they just look the same. They're like this blue and white pattern. So yeah, I can, Barry, do you want to take another question or is? Yeah, I, um, so this one I can answer and I think the other ones are really uh, better for you to answer, but uh, okay. the, question, the question is Dr. Gordon Chang mentions that railroad workers wrote thousands of letters home to China, but he also says there was a lack of documents. What am I missing here? Were all the letters destroyed? I think that's a great question. Um, as I mentioned a second ago, um, I think a couple of things happened. One, it's a very humid, wet environment. And so if you think of paper from the turn of the century, I think it's tissue-like. And um, I think a lot of it just, you know, um, and uh, most of these buildings are open. They're not climate controlled. They're, they have open skylights and the doors are open often because it's warm. 
So I think the paper would not last very long. So I think a lot of that material was lost uh, that way. And secondly, you have to remember about the Cultural Revolution. And I think a lot of the uh, ties to the West were destroyed intentionally or hidden or buried or, or paper reused or burned. Um, so I think that's where the erasure happens in, in China. In the United States, I, I think there was correspondence going back and forth in remittance records. Um, a lot of that coming through San Francisco. And you have to remember 1906, the earthquake and fire destroyed 80% of the city and most of Chinatown. And I actually have an oral history of a family that, um, that was sending remittances back to China. And this uh, woman who you know, was a young child at the time was saying that she remembers her grandfather's uh, these baskets full of papers of re remittances from China and uh, and after the fire that, that was all destroyed. So I think those are two uh, you know major reasons why uh, the documents don't exist anymore. Yeah, that's uh, exactly how I would have answered that. <laughs> so I'll take Jessica Schur's question. Um, from all of the artifacts excavated, roughly what percentage were crossover artifacts that were also found in the US? And so I'll answer that first. Um, at Tongdong Village, okay, let me, let me start with uh, the US side of things because there are actually not that many types of ceramic patterns. And I'll just focus on the everyday like rice bowl, like what you would use in your table dining table. And so there are basically four patterns, um, actually three because it, the double happiness pattern in the US, it kind of drops off of Chinatowns that post date were established after the 1880s. But there's some evidence that that it came back, the pattern came back in the 1930s. So the other three patterns that we find pretty much every Chinatown site. Um, and I, it would be winter green, the uh, four seasons flower, and then bamboo. And that's a blue on white. And the other two are colorful and more expensive generally. And as a couple of people mentioned in the Chengdung Village documentary, there was no four seasons flower found in Chengdung Village, whereas the other three patterns were found and this is interesting. I mean, why is that? <laughs> so perhaps different market access was probably an issue. But what's interesting is that I'm studying the, a different home village. And I have found double, uh, four seasons flower in my village. <laughs> so I not only like fragments of rice bowls, but spoon fragment, uh, uh, condiment plates. So this is also a pattern that um, lasted a long time. So maybe the artifacts from my site date to like, you know, a later time period, whereas at Chengdong village, maybe there weren't as many immigrants going to the US um, in the 1930s. I mean, they could have gone to, well, we know that they went to like Singapore, they went to Canada, Australia and the US. So it's actually quite a diverse diaspora that um, Chandong Village represents. And so that's that first question. The second question from Jessica is, any insight as to what specific types of objects or tools the workers brought back to the US as gifts or coveted items that the villagers might not have had? I don't know if Barry, you want, have anything, any? I think, the, uh, yeah, for me, I think the interesting thing is, I don't know the answer to that directly, but the interesting <laughs> part, the, the interesting thing to me is the technology, the technology that they brought back. So um, uh, steel and concrete construction, uh, you know, to, to other, yeah. other messes for tool and it went both ways. So the, uh, you know, the Chinese brought lots of bridge building, mining, digging uh, technology to the US that, that that did not exist here or was not being used here. And then the technology transfer happened the other way. So I don't see some, I didn't see myself so much um, material, but I, I did see evidence of the technology. Yeah, I remember reading Professor Celia Tan's master's or, or um, uh, PhD dissertation. 
I think she does talk about Portland cement, so Portland connection um, being used to build these 1920s, 1930s uh, multi-story buildings, watchtowers, mansions, whereas traditional Chinese house is, is made of brick and timber and there's no concrete or steel or cement. So that's, uh, that was interesting to read about. And I think in terms of tools, we didn't find anything that was directly connected to the US. But I, I do remember reading a blog post by a woman a historian, Kate Bagnell, who went to a village um, that's connected to an Australian uh, Chinese immigrant. And they found a shovel that was an Australian brand shovel. <laughs> So somebody brought that back to the village. Um, and if you guys can Google it, you could probably find that little story. Is there another question you want to answer, yeah. Barry? So I'll start the, uh, this one, which I think is another great question uh, from Maris. Um, th there's a Western narrative about the Chinese government and its reluctance to let outside scientists into China, plus the erasure of certain aspects of Chinese history during the Cultural Revolution. Dr. Voss, mentioned that the initial excavation permit was denied. During your research, have you experienced any of this or is it an inaccurate narrative to keep perpetuating here in the US? So uh, my perspective is generally that uh, the Chinese government, the um, university, Wu Yi University and the scholars there were unbelievably supportive. Uh, they were you know, providing us with uh, housing, meals, rides, uh, there was no monitor uh, from the government watching what the team was doing. Uh, the, the moment where um, the project was delayed by a permit was more administrative, administrative error than, than reluctance of the government. Um, it, from my perspective, I think the US-China relationships have denormalized uh, because of, over the last four years or four and a half years and hope, uh, hoping that it will renormalize so that uh, research like this can continue. And I think they're, uh, I'm sure Laura will say the same, uh, guarded about what we, what we took out of the country and what was being found in the same way that- uh, We didn't if take a, anything out of the country, <laughs> just to be correct. clear. <laughs> yeah, so the, that, that, I mean, that's you know, one of the big requir requirements that things could be studied, but they would not be taken out of the country. And I think we do the same. If a Chinese or Taiwanese or Korean uh, archaeology team came to the U.S., we wouldn't let them take anything out either. So I think that's that that's quite expected. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would say Ryan Kennedy, who studies fish bones, he got to take fish bones from fish that he bought fresh, and like, you know, he he cleaned it off and then vacuum sealed the fish bone and then brought it back to the U.S. to for his comparative collection so that if he found any fish bones in the US, he could compare that to his, his entire collection. So that was great for him. Um, even though in the documentary, we say he didn't, he didn't really find that much <laughs> in terms of faunal remains. But I also wanna say that um, in, in terms of archeological collaboration, the standard Chinese um, practice is Foreigners cannot do archaeology projects in China alone. They have to collaborate with a with a Chinese, um, you know, the provincial uh, archaeologist or a university. So that's always been their practice. And of course, like I think that's what what should be done anyway, even if that wasn't the the rule. And Another thing is in terms of the cultural revolution erasing a lot of history, that is, that is true. And there's, I, I feel that Professor Celia Tan, I think her research um, program, her practice in terms of architectural restoration is to show the layers of history. So when she uh, renovated or whatever, restored two different um, ancestral halls that were built in the 1930s, I believe, in Changdong Village. One was restored fully to the 1930s original look, and the other one kept those layers of history. So, for example, 
on the uh, on the inside there is a stove a communal stove from the cultural revolution and that was kept they actually restored that stove and they kept a whitewashing uh from that time period so it's it's a difficult history um but i think the way that she views that um that importance of showing everything is is really uh you know what I think uh, a lot of um, you know architectural historians would say is 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 something they would do too in the U.S. So there's definitely um, yeah a lot of nuance and <laughs> we could go on about that. But is there another there's, question? Yeah, there's a great one. Have the efforts to marginalize non-Mandarin dialects impacted research in any way? In another way, has the lack of modern Cantonese, oops, it moved. Oh, the lack of sorry. modern Cantonese speakers and readers affected research efforts in any way? Uh, so that's a question that I asked uh, uh, Celia and, and other people in, uh, that live in the area about whether Cantonese is a dying language. And they, uh, they will fiercely deny that that is happening that they, um, they will continue to teach their children to speak Cantonese and the, and the dialect um, and that they expect their children to do the same. Um, I think it would be like telling uh, Texans to lose the drawl, you know, and, and it's just so much part of the culture that it won't happen. I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime happen. Laura? Yeah, let me read this question again. Um, <laughs> Has the lack of modern Cantonese speakers and readers affected research efforts? I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would say that's true because I, I think there are modern Cantonese speakers. They're in, they're in Taishan and they're in Kaiping. And you know, one of my friends when I lived in in Taishan for six months to do my research, he, my friend, he's uh, lives in New York City, but he goes there all the time. He says, there are words in Taishanese for, you know, every part of a bicycle, like a derailleur or whatever. <laughs> There's words for coronavirus, you know, in Taishanese. So I think the idea that this is a dying language um, is not true because people are coming up with new words for, for things that, you know, are new and foreign, I guess, um, Western. But in terms of the US and how we've studied Chinatowns and Chinese railroad workers, yes, there is a lack of people who speak Cantonese, who speak Taishanese, people like me, um, who, who can use that, um, use their background, draw on that to interpret, you know, the artifacts, the, the site histories um, and to connect the two sides of the Pacific, um, because I mean, I'm the, my parents, you know, as I said, are immigrants from China. So I literally called them up and asked them about stuff. And that's been great for my research. Um, and just talking to the villagers when we were doing archeology span in Changdong village, you know, I'm like the only one who speaks the Kaiping dialect and the people who are still living in the village, they are, like in their 60s, um, they're like grandparents taking care of their grandchildren while their children work in the cities. And they can understand Mandarin, which some of the team members spoke or Cantonese, but they will only speak back to you in their dialect. So it's, it is important to have people who, who speak the dialect to do this research. And you can't just grab a person who speaks Mandarin only to be, to do your research or interpret your any letters from Chinese immigrants. Um, so I think that is really important. There's a, a question here from Keith Lee. Um, will there be other investigations of other Taishan villages? And then he goes <laughs> on to talk about his own uh, family and uh, that they had letters from the 1930s and so forth. Uh, you probably can answer the first one, but the second point I would make is, uh, you know, there are obviously hundreds or thousands of these villages and uh, research couldn't cover all of them. Uh, so my, my suggestion to you all is if you have relatives that are older that have memories of their village that you start using your phone, 
or whatever device you have handy, iPad, and start recording oral histories 10 or 20 minutes at a time after dinner, give them a glass of wine, let them tell some stories. Um, that is the way we're going to preserve this history. I don't, um, you know, Dr. Voss's project was really quite massive. If you, you think about the number of years, the number of people, material tools that had to be brought back and forth, uh, really a huge endeavor. And so getting it done for one village was amazing and, and, and you know, impossible to do for the other hundreds or thousands that are out there. Laura? Yeah. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm doing the second project in the home village and it's in Taishan in um, the town of Suibu or Suibu in Mandarin. And so it's not Huayan or Haiyan, which is um, further south near the, the ocean, but, or the coast. Um, so I think, yeah, there definitely needs to be more research, um, but you need to have like I said, like the right team, the, you need to establish the collaboration with the local um, university and the archeologists. But I think what Barry said is, is exactly right. Like to, in order for me to do my research, which was on, a, on the two Chinatowns in Southern California and, and in the home village, I actually relied on a lot of information gathered by the descendants of the two Chinatowns. And they've, they have their own websites, like family history. They've done oral histories because they care about sharing what they know about their, their grandparents who came in the 1880s. And without that foundation, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't even have much to go on to, to know that that village was a, a one that I should study. And now I have this project that is my dissertation. So I, I definitely urge everyone <laughs> to collect whatever you have and then we can we can go from there. Thank you, Barry and Laura. I know we're a little bit over time and folks are very interested and have lots of questions. So we appreciate our guests. I do want to just pause here and uh, invite Jackie, our ED to come back and close out for the day. Um, while Jackie is unmuting, Kapiolani, do you have any <laughs> closing remarks? Oh, I just wanted to thank both Barry and Laura for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I enjoyed the film so much. Um, I think Tracy was mentioning to me, like, we never think about how uh, immigration works both ways, like that circular relationship. Um, so I really love having an opportunity to see what you have all been working on. So um, I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Kapilani. So Piolani, do you also want to speak about some upcoming events for the Portland Chinatown Museum? Yes, uh, we have a second uh, program in the Hidden History series. Um, I know everyone really enjoyed this one. So if you'd like to continue learning more, about the hidden histories. Um, we have a, an event coming up on April 24th, uh, which is Saturday at 10.30 a.m. And we'll be going to uh, Salem, um, where there is a really interesting project um, with recovering a Chinese shrine um, in the city of Salem and reconnecting it with the, um, Sarah, maybe you can help me with the pronunciation, the King Ming. Uh, festival. Right, the Qingming, uh, sweeping of the Qingming tomb. Festival and um, making it an active uh, cultural site again. So we're going to be hearing from um, Kylie Pine and Kimberly Fitzgerald, um, Myron Lee and um, Professor Juen, um, who will be talking more about the work that they're doing in the Salem area. So it should be a really great uh, program. We will, be, we will be updating um, the website with more information and how you can sign up for that. So that will be on April 24th, Saturday at 1030. So I just want to add uh, my thank yous to both Mary and Laura for this very, very fascinating uh, presentation today. And kudos to both of you and the work that you do do. And I just want to mention that uh, we're very pleased um, to present these uh, virtual uh, uh, presentations and conversations free to our audiences. 
Um, as you all know, our museum's been closed uh, since mid-March of 2020 for um, because of the pandemic and we had to close for health and safety reasons and, and state mandates. And we really had no idea that it, we would be down this long and we still are closed. We're hoping to reopen sometime later, late spring, summer, um, but we've continued working very, very hard for you on the museum side. And, uh, most of you have shown your ongoing support through your donations and they have helped make a big, big difference. So we want to offer the opportunity for you to continue your support. And so you're welcome to go onto our website, um, which is www.portlandchinatown.org. So thank you. We want to say thank you on behalf of the board and behalf of the staff and museum. Thank you so much to both of you and to our viewers. And we're just real appreciative and gratitude to our museum friends and supporters. So thank you all for joining us today on this very beautiful day. Enjoy your spring. Thank you. Actually, can I add one more thing? Uh, yes. So in, uh, I'll, you can look up the film on Vimeo again. It's called Making Ties Stanford. You can find it if you wanna watch it again. But also I have Added, I have um, combined this film with two other projects that I did, I did for Stanford. One was uh, oral history with about 50 uh, railroad worker descendants and plus a story about uh, historian Phil Choi who uh, spent his life really trying to get Chinese Americans on the map and get recognized for the railroad work. It, the film's called Celestials. It premieres on May 8th and I'll send a link to you, uh, to your organization that you can pass on. Oh, wonderful. Uh, hopefully, yeah. That's wonderful. It's wonderful work that you are doing. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much Thank for having you. us. It's a quite an honor and pleasure. Thank you. You all have a great rest of your day. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.